Welcome to MHF4U, Grade 12 Functions, Section 1.3. Today we're going to discuss properties of graphs and functions. So first of all, what is a parent function, and what are some examples? So the parent function is known as the simplest form of function within a family of functions. So we have seven main parent functions here. Uh, the first one is linear, so f of x is equal to x. Second one is quadratic, g of x is equal to x squared. Third one is reciprocal h of x is equal to 1 over x, fourth one is absolute, k of x is equal to absolute value of x, uh, fifth one is a square root function, so m of x is equal to square root of x, sixth one is exponential, p of x is equal to 2 to the power of x, and the sixth one is trigonometric. Um, where's the g? Okay. <laughs> so then we'll talk about some definitions here, and these will help us understand and define uh, and analyze our parent functions. So an interval of increase is known as the intervals within a function's domain where the y values of the function get larger and larger moving from left to right. Okay, so here we see that as we move from left to right, or the x values, you know, moving left to right of the function, so the x values are getting bigger and bigger, uh, the y values need to get bigger and bigger as well. So we can see here that there's some increase happening right in this area right here, and similarly in this area right here, the y values are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and bigger and bigger bigger up here. So the interval of decrease is the opposite. It's intervals within, the, within a function's domain where the y values of the function get smaller moving from left to right. So again, we're looking at the domain we're moving left to right. So we're looking across the x values. And then as we look across the x values, we're looking at the y values that correspond to it. And we're seeing where the y values get smaller. Okay, so in this case, the y values are getting smaller right in this area right here. Okay, then we talk about continuous and discontinuous functions. So a continuous function is any function that does not contain any holes or breaks across its entire domain. So you'll see I have the word pencil written here, and the reason why I have that is in order to draw a continuous function, you never have to lift your pencil, right? So I can just, you know, just draw the function like that, and I'll never have to lift my pencil, and that's why I know it's continuous. Um, and when there's discontinuity, there's a break in the graph of the function, and that is called a point of discontinuity. So in this case, we can see there's two, two types of this you can have. Uh, one being where it's undefined, so here we can see there's a hole, and that means that it's undefined in that in that hole. And furthermore, there's a break here, so here we can see that you know there's no line connecting this function at this point; it's just a, it's just a break, so that's a discontinuity. And we have to lift our pencil in either of these cases. Okay, then we talk about odd and even functions. So an odd function is any function that does uh, that has rotational symmetry about its origin algebraically, and all odd functions have the property f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. So the algebraic property is, is useful because let's say you're giving a set of functions and sort of, um, yeah, a set of functions, you can actually test algebraically uh, whether the function is odd or even. So even function is any function that is symmetric about the y-axis algebraically, and all even functions have the property f of negative x is equal to f of x. Perfect. Um, okay. So then um, I gathered this chart here with some key features of parent functions. So we're going to go through this chart and the graphs and try to analyze and understand the important features of each parent function. So first off, we have our linear function. Okay, so we know our graph of the linear function, very straightforward, like a line. Um, and we can look at the table of values here that gave us this graph. Um, and again, you can see that you know because of y is equal to x, or f of x is equal to x, x and y will be the same value throughout. So some special features are characteristics. So the line intersects the y-axis at 0, 0, so that's the origin. We can see that right here. The domain is all real numbers, okay, and the range is all real numbers. Okay, so basically any real number can will be, will be found in this function, uh, provided it's inputted. All right, then we get to the quadratic function. So this function we've seen before as well in um, previous lessons, and this function is known to be f of x equal to x squared. So some important points here is that the graph intersects the y-axis at 0, 0, the domain is all real numbers, and the range is all real numbers greater than or equal to 0. Okay, So you can never have a negative y-value or a negative output. You can never have that with a quadratic function. All right, then we move to the square root function. So the square root function, f of x equals the square root of x, uh, important points here. So the line intersects the y-axis at 0, 0. We see that again here. Domain is all real numbers greater than or equal to zero, and range is all real numbers greater than or equal to zero. So for the square root function, you'll notice here that there's errors. Whenever I have a negative input, there's errors for the output, and that's because 
um, once you put in a negative value as the input, your output is imaginary. It's no longer a real number, right? As we've said here with domain and range, it's only all real numbers, which is why we can only input positive values or values that are greater than or equal to zero for this query function. Okay. Lastly, we have the reciprocal function. Um, okay, and so for the reciprocal function, it's f of x is equal to 1 over x. And this function never intersects the y-axis, right? We see that here. So, you know, this y, like the y-axis, the function is asymptotic um, around the y-axis. So these values, it's, it's it, you know, it's approaching, it's approaching, it's approaching, but it's never actually going to touch that line um, of y. And similarly here, right, it's approaching, but it's never actually going to touch that value, um, never going to touch the y-axis. And we see that here with, you know, which values are undefined in the table of values as well. So the domain is all real numbers except for zero, and the range is all real numbers except for zero. So similarly here, you know, it's asymptotic about the x-axis too. It's never going to actually touch the x-axis. Um, never going to touch the x-axis here either. Okay. So in our next set, we have the expon exponential function. Uh, and so this function is y is equal to 2 to the power of x, or f of x is equal to 2 to the power of x. And this function crosses the y-axis at 0, 1. Okay, Domain is all real numbers, and range is all real numbers, except for 0. So here you can think about it, right? If I put in 2 to the power of 0, I'm going to get 1, right? Which is why, right? And furthermore, because it's an exp exponential function, I'm never actually going to touch 0 with my output. And, you know, lastly, if even if I were to put in a negative input for my x, I would still get a positive output. It would just end up being a fraction. So let's say I put in 2 to the power of negative 1, I'm going to get half as my output. All right. And that's why this function is always positive. Uh, logarithmic function. So this is f of x is equal to log of x. And so this function crosses the x-axis at 1, 0. The domain is all real numbers greater than 0, and the range is all real numbers greater than or equal to 0. All right. And then we get to the absolute value function. So f of x is equal to absolute value of x. This crosses the y-axis at 0, 0. Domain is all real numbers, and range is all real numbers greater than or equal to 0. And we've talked about the absolute value function previously as well. All right. So the summary. So functions can be categorized based on their graphical characteristics. So domain and range, x-intercepts and y-intercepts, continuity and discontinuity, intervals of increase and decrease, symmetry, even or odd, and end behavior. So let's go back and just talk about end behavior real quick. I've introduced it a little bit previously, but just formally, basically end behavior, it is what it sounds like. So we're talking about what happens at the extremities of the function. So, you know, you should be able to predict, um, based on the characteristics of the function, what's going to happen at the extremities. And that's what the end behavior means. And the way you can describe that is, well, as x approaches infinity, um, what will happen to y? As x approaches negative infinity, what would happen to y? So then we then move on to examples. Uh, so for each pair of functions, give a characteristic that the two functions have in common and a characteristic that distinguishes between them. Okay, so for example, A, we have f of x is equal to 1 over x and g of x is equal to x. So the thing they have both have in common is that they're, they're both odd, and the thing that they have different is, is their domain. So if you think about it, for f of x is equal to 1 over x, you can't ever have uh, x equal to 0 in the domain. So that would be a restriction of the domain. Whereas for g of x equal to x, you can have any real numbers. So that's why the domains are different. Then for b, um, f of x is equal to sine x and g of x is equal to x. So they both have the same domain. x is element of the real numbers, so you can put in any real number into the domain and it will work for the function. Um, but sine x has more zeros. So if you think about the graphs of sine x and g of x, which is equal to x, uh, g of x only crosses the x-axis once, whereas sine x will cross the x-axis periodically, um, and more, you know, more than once, depending on how long the period of the function is. Okay, then we have uh, f of x is equal to x and g of x is equal to x squared for c. So the domain is what they both have in common; it's both the real numbers. And then we can see that the end behavior of the functions are different. So in the case of f of x equal to x, uh, we can see that you know, as x increases, um, y will approach positive values, and as x decreases, y will approach negative values. Whereas for the quadratic function, whether or not x increases or decreases, y will always approach positive values. Lastly, for part d, f of x is equal to 2 to the power of x, and g of x is equal to absolute value of x. 
we see a similar thing happening here where um, when x approaches positive values, you know, for 2 to the power of x, it will always keep increasing positively. And for g of x, whether or not x is negative or positive, we will also approach uh, both positive values. Okay, so then question five. For each function, determine f of x, f of negative x, and negative f of x, and compare with f of x. And you're going to use this to decide whether each function is even, odd, or neither. Okay, so for part a, we have f of x is equal to x squared minus 4. And f of 1 is equal to 1 minus 4, which is equal to negative 3. Very straightforward. Uh, similarly, you find f of negative 1, we get negative 3. And negative f of 1, we get 3. Okay, okay. So now we return to our definition of even functions around odd functions. And we see that when f of when we have f of negative x, it'll equal to f of x. Okay, so then we go down here, and we can see that f of negative 1, in this case, is negative 3, and this is equal to f of 1, which is negative 3. So that's how we know it's even, is that f of negative x is equal to f of x. 6. Determine a possible parent function that could serve as a model for each of the following situations, and explain your choice. Okay, so A, we have the number of marks away from the class average that the student's test score is. So, because here we're talking about how many units it away away it is from an from a you know like a, an average score, that means we're talking about the absolute value, right? Because we're talking about the distance away that it is from the average. For part B, the height of a person above the ground during several rotations of a Ferris wheel. So this we can use sine of x because it's periodic motion. So this motion will the same motion will occur continuously over time, and that's how you know it's periodic. C we have the population of Earth to, through time, so you can use 2 to the power of x, it gets exponential, it's it's increasing um, at a greater rate as time progresses. In D, we have the amount of total money saved if you put aside exactly one dollar each day. And that would be x, because it's the same amount you're putting away, right? So, um, and that's how we know it's a linear function. Okay, so that's all for this video. Um, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us on our website. Uh, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed it. And see you in the next video. Thank you.